Um, just to say that Ori was uh, born in Israel and immigrated to London in 1988 and has really made an extraordinary body of work which, as I say in the wall text, um, combines exquisite beauty with a sense of traumatic historical memory. And for me, it is really finally, it's, it's a, a body of work that um, is extremely, again, exquisitely balanced in such a way that it doesn't, um, doesn't offer you a, in a sense, a, a, like an answer. It provokes questions, and I think it is a, it's work that is deeply um, empathetic. Um, and speaks to us as um, as human beings as much as um, to any sort of position. So, and, and I think that's a real um, that's a real achievement is to make to make work that is emotive and historically loaded um, with some very important issues that are really topical at the moment, and and yet um, ones that again create a sense of empathy and a, have a really strong sense of humanity to them, as well as combining a, a series of uh, art historical references. So th it's a really, a really layered um, body of work, and I understand that we will be seeing a, a new piece that is being premiered. Is it being shown for the it's first time? A new time? body of work, really. Yes. We so, um, so we are really fortunate here in Columbus to. Uh, to witness that. So without further ado, uh, just introduce All right, Let's, thank you. Uh, some applause for Ori. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay, so we can turn the lights down. And um, okay, I'm gonna um, introduce my work this evening. I'm gonna start with work that I produced in the last uh, seven or eight years, and I'm going to move into a new body of work that I'm just about finish, finished or about to finish. There are some elements that uh, are still in progress. And um, at a very intense summer, I actually work on the new body of work for oh, just about a year. I started last October, and it's been very intense and um, sort of an um, introverted experience. Um, I mean, I work on occasion with, um, with a large team, but uh, I was in the studio constantly, and this summer we skipped uh, summer uh, vacations, and I was working until, until um, the very last minute. So um, it's, I have to say that it's kind of special for me tonight to introduce this work and to expose it to audience for the first time. But before I get to the new body of work, I would like to start with um, um, an historical painting, a very famous one, a painting that was produced by Goya. Is it possible to turn the lights down a bit more? A couple of notches down. So um, uh, this painting, the, the 3rd of May, 9, uh, 1808, was produced in, uh, by Goya. Allegedly, Goya was there as a witness when Napoleonic troops invaded my Madrid, and um, there was an horrific massacre. Consequence to this, he produced this painting. So it's kind of important that he was allegedly an eyewitness. And this is one of the last grand historical painting, and it got all the element of an historical uh, historic painting. The, um, the proportions are very large, it's very dramatic. The event is taking place at night. There is one light that is shining in the middle of the scene, and the scene is actually representing the entire narrative. So we see the before, the actual event, and the after event, the aftermath. So we see the dead bodies on the floor, we see the soldiers that are pointing the gun, they're about to shoot. We see the moment of the execution, see people covering their faces because they can't see or can't look any longer. There is the central figure wearing white shirt in a gesture of um, crucifixion. And um, 
It's really important, I mean, this element of um, or the way the narrative is unf unfolding in this painting and the fact that it was crucial for Goya to express the entire narrative is, um, um, is fundamental. And I would like to show this painting in comparison to another painting that was produced a few years later by Manet. This painting uh, described the execution of Maximilian in Mexico. Uh, there were a few versions, or there are a few versions of this painting, and I'll just, uh, as a reference point, use the uh, stated date 1867, where this painting was completed. Manet was not in Mexico at the time. He didn't see the event. He read about it. It was a, a extensively, there was extensive coverage in the um, French press. And um, based on the information, he produced a painting, obviously he was influenced by Goya, but there are some fundamental differences between this painting and the painting that was created by Goya. Um, obviously this painting is not as dramatic, it takes place during daytime, um, there are no dead bodies on the floor. Actually, the narrative is very restricted, and there is something quite trivial, almost casual, about these paintings. So we see one of the soldiers here that actually turning away from the scene and preoccupied with his own gun, cleaning it, or, um, and then um, these figures are presenting a sort of anticlimax, or, or bring those, the drama right down. The crucial thing about this painting is actually the smoke. This painting is trying to capture a moment of a bullet that is leaving the barrel. It's a moment of suspense. We see something that is about to happen, um, or we see an event that is happening in a flash. There are no dead bodies yet. The bullet was just left the gun, and it's being expressed by the smoke. This fundamental difference between the two paintings, I think that the timing is, is, is actually crucial. So Goya completed his painting in 1814, and Manet completed his in 1867. Between those two moments, photography was invented. This was um, 1839. Officially, photography was registered as a patent. And I think that what, I mean, this difference is, um, is, is pinnacle to the way painters start to conceive and represent the world. I'd like to show you another element that is kind of interesting. What Manet did see is, uh, was this shirt of Maximilian. This was a photograph that was published in the French press. And based on those evidence, he constructed this painting. I think that one of the things that for me it's really interesting when I look at those two paintings is that Manet was unable to, or photography was unable at the time to deliver what Manet was actually representing in his painting because the technology was not there yet. Around the same time that uh, Manet produced his painting, actually a few years earlier, in 1855, Roger Fenton, a British photographer, was sent to the Crimean War to document, actually to sway the public opinion about the war, because um, um, the, the royal family decided to send him to show some positive, or to bring some positive images. And uh, he was not supposed to depict any dead bodies and so forth. But also, it was impossible for him to depict any action. Because technology at the time, photographic technology, did not allow him to capture anything at the moment of action. It was still glass plate. He had to cover the plate with the emulsion just a few minutes before taking the photograph. The exposure were extremely long. And therefore, if ever anyone was moving across the picture, they would disappear, they would evaporate, they would turn into ghosts. So Roger Fenton was only able to photograph landscape, the aftermath. This is a famous photograph of him where we see cannonballs distributed on the, in the landscape. It's a, it's a location of a very bloody battle. Um, it's called, uh, the, the place is the, the valley um, of, the of the shadows of death, but we don't see any dead body. And it's a fundamental difference again between this photograph and the Manet painting. Manet is already talking about something that photography can promise conceptually, to capture a moment in a flash, to capture something that the eyes cannot even, uh, or optically the eye can catch, but the brain cannot conceive or process. 
Roger Fenton actually used the medium of photography and was unable to do this. And I think it's interesting also to think about the Manet in relation to Goya. Um, could be that uh, because of the invention of photography, the role of historical painting and the position of painting is kind of shifting. And then I want to move um, some you know, few years later to move into 1936. This is during the Spanish Civil War. And just around the time where the 35 millimeter cameras were invented and the film became much faster, and a photographer named Robert Kappa that founded Magnum was, was there. And because he had this new piece of equipment, he was able to run with the troops and to take photographs of action as and when it occurred. And allegedly he photographed this guy, this same um, fighter, at the moment that at the moment of death, at the moment that he was shot down, at the moment that the bullet was actually penetrating his body. And today we know that this photograph was fabricated and um, it was all um, an act. And when people review Kappa's contact sheets, they, there are evidence that then the guy gets up and there are more photographs. But it's, beyond, it's not the point. What is really important here is that what, you know, what photography can do. And photography can capture something, a moment that is extraordinary. We are looking at somebody at the moment of death, but he's still alive. We see somebody that the bullet is penetrating his body and he's suspended. There is a paradox here, a paradox that we cannot experience in our life. Somebody that is simultaneously alive and dead. Somebody that is in this, in this um, cross-section between those two states. And it's very close to what Manet is trying to do, but taking it a, a step further. It's not a moment that the bullet leaves the barrier. We are here looking at the moment that the bullet is penetrating the body. And we have this friction, this moment of suspense, um, a paradox. And I think that this paradox is very interesting because the whole relationship or the way photography allows us to experience and think about time is, is crucial. And I'm showing all this because Something that I'm very interested in, I'm going to start to show now in my work, is about some relationships that exist between technology and our perception of the world. The way technology affected art through the years and um, affected the way artists attempt to represent the world and also affected the way reality is perceived. So the boundaries of reality are constantly expanding and changing according to um, among other, our visual experiences. And I want to show another historical photograph before I move into my own work. And this is a photograph that was taken by Degas. And this was, photograph was taken in um, 1838, so officially a year before photography was invented. And, the, and he was taking this photograph outside of his studio. Actually, it's, these are two images out of a series of four. And the camera didn't move. He photographed the same corner four times at different times of the day. And he was puzzled by the results. Because he saw the same place, but the shadows were shifting because the, the sun was moving about. And it was the first time, and you reflect on it, that somebody was able to look at time as if folding upon itself. We can see the same thing, different time of the day, at the same time. There is something about the compression of time, this impossibility, something that we can never experience in our linear experience of time. We're moving in a single trajectory, and we have flashbacks of memory, we project to the future, but to be able physically to face and to look at the same thing simultaneously, it's it's very peculiar, and it shifted a lot of... It shifted the understanding of the world and our relationship to the passage of time and to space. In 2007, I started to work on this series of photographs that was called Time After Time. It's a series of photographs that were based on named Dutch and old masters, particularly looking at um, paintings of flowers from the late 70s and early 18th century. 
And one of the things that interests me about these photographs, these photographs were, were taken at the moment of explosion. So I froze the flowers with liquid nitrogen, so they became very brittle, and then I exploded them with, um, with pyrotechnics. And it started with this idea that the vase and the flowers will, um, will be exploded to um, an high pitch sound, and slowly it kind of shifted, and I started to use explosive devices. And the moment that I took these photographs is also an impossible moment. Obviously, they're happening at an incredible speed. So the Dutch old masters, and I'll just show you an example. This is one of the paintings that I was looking at, a, a, a painting by Jan van Eysen that a, is a, the collection of the National Gallery in London. So the Dutch old master could not comprehend these moments that I'm depicting did not exist for them. It didn't exist for them physically, but also mentally. There is no way that anyone around this time could think or conceive such a moment. It's only the technology that came later that allow me to capture this moment. And the moment I capture it and present it, it expands our kind of consciousness, and all of a sudden, we accept them as part of our understanding of the world. In the same way that when the microscope was invented, or a telescope is invented, we were able to see minute particles that we are unable to see with our naked eye. The moment we see them one time and they're registered in our mind, then they become part of our knowledge of the world, understanding of the world, and we always use them as some sort of reference point. Those kind of visual experiences are becoming fundamental. What was um, interesting for me in these photographs is, again, something similar to what I showed in the Kappa picture. There is a paradox here. Because we see, again, a collision between two moments. The flowers are still holding together, but we obviously see the energy of the explosion that is pushing outward, and everything is already is also, at the same time, falling apart. There is a paradox between a moment that, of destruction and still the, the flowers are holding are holding the structure, holding the integrity. I want to talk about this in, in relation to something that Ronald Barth mentioned in his book, Camera Lucida, when he, he tried to rediscover his mother after, his, after her death, and he wrote this kind of poetic book. And in one of the pages, he referred to this guy, um, this is a photograph that was taken by Alexander Pine. Um, and um, this guy is one of a group of gangs that were, tr that were attempting to murder one of the ministers in the Lincoln regime. This photograph was taken a few minutes before his execution. And because there were a lot of naivety about photography at the time and voyeurism, or, uh, the kind of sense of privacy, the, um, uh, the photographer was allowed to come and take these, these images. And um, Ronald Bass talked about the point of view of the sitter here and the fact that he's looking behind the camera. By the time we are looking at this photograph, this person is already dead. And um, he kind of brings these tragedies that is inherent in every photograph, something that we, we look at the moment that of um, this has been and this will be. We look at something that already happened, but we, there is also the projection of something that is about to happen. Another thing that is interesting about photography in this respect, that this guy, because, he was, because his photograph he was captured on film, will live forever. He's somehow frozen in this eternal present. And everyone that was involved in the execution is now dead and forgotten. So there are these kind of paradoxes that exist and they are very much at the essence of, um, of the photographic medium. Um, in all these photographs from the series of time after time, this paradox is, um, is very much apparent. As if those images are violating the passage of time or arresting a moment that is the crossroad between the past and the future. 
And it's true that it's relevant to every photograph, but there is a moment that is much closer to what I um, think Kratia Bresson described as a decisive moment, a moment that all the elements are reaching this kind of um, a pregnancy, a tension. Everything is about, in one second, in this famous photograph of Kratia Bresson, everything will be contaminated. There will be a splash, there will be dirt. This is the moment where the composition is just at its height. And I think that it's very relevant to those moments that I'm attempting to capture in, the, in, those explosive, in these explosive photographs. Following the Time After Time series, I moved on to um, create these groups of photographs that I titled Blow Up. In the blob photograph, the time after time were very small and contained. The blob photograph, what I wanted to do is to es establish images that would be very large in scale. And the scale was not just uh, for, for its own sake, but I wanted to create a certain tension that I was unable to create in the, uh, achieving the time after time. I wanted to capture as many details as possible. And I wanted those details to be so sharp that the naked eye will never be able to digest them and um, or, or process them simultaneously. There is something about photography that um, a, a photographic pride, the camera can capture almost instantaneously uh, something that would be close to infinite numbers of detail. And um, the ability of the, cam the, uh, of the camera to remember, it's, um, it's extraordinary. And I have um, a sort of a desire to defeat this ability and to create an image that will be condensed with so much information that even the camera will struggle with. There is another thing that interests me about those, uh, the numbers of detail. I often find that when I look at photographs, um, the moment I've seen them, and I know them, I have no desire to come back and look at them again. And this is something that doesn't happen when I look at painting. And I think it has to do with the surface of a painting, the physical presence of the pigments of the paint. There is something that is in the surface that keeps on radiating and feeding itself. And when looking at photographs, it doesn't happen, because photography does not have a surface. When we look at a photograph, we always look at an, a virtual image. We can never go to the image, we can never touch the image. The image is suspended somewhere beyond the surface. And I'm very much interested in creating images that will not be about um, an anecdotal or a didactic experience, but will create a much more sensual experience and an experience that is very much um, visual and very difficult to pin down or to hold on to. And this idea of, to use the word infinite is a, is a bit bombastic, but um, so much detail that as the viewer comes to, to the image, constantly new information is, is, is peeling and opening up, and at every encounter with the image, there will be new details that will reveal themselves. And the large scale is obviously um, allowing those relationships to occur. But there is another thing about those, uh, the, the large scale. I began to work with, with a new camera, with this camera that the uh, Asselblad developed, and those high-resolution cameras um, allowed me to achieve attention to detail or information in such a way that was impossible up to this point. And those cameras were able to capture information that the naked eye will never be able to attain. And I kind of felt that by blowing these images to such a scale, to a scale where the image still holds itself together and reveal information to the eye, that the technology is, uh, as if the technology were mediating and allowing us to or opening um, 
opening doors that we were that we were prevailed from without the camera was very uh, was was a great in became a kind of a, 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 a great interest and and a, a very attractive idea. These photographs were related to a series of paintings that were produced by Fontaine Latour in the 19th century. Fontaine Latour was a French painter, a sort of bourgeoisie painter that created painting at a modest scale. Ex they were exquisitely done, but they were very... Um, they were produced in a very manageable size, and it was very, very important because it, they were very comfortable to hang in houses. They were unoffensive. But despite all this, there was a twist to them. There was a period where Fontaine Latour produced paintings that the palette of his painting was restricted to the tricolor of the French flag. So when you look at something like this, you'll see that everything moved between the whites with some yellows in them, the reds with some pinks in them, and the blues. And the um, ideological undertone was um, the reason that I was really attracted to this painting. And the tension that existed between what, on, what they're supposed to represent on the surface and some um, ideological discourses that were hidden or invested in them. I want to move to a detail of the photograph that I showed you before. And it's always difficult presenting work with a projector because then I can never show them at full resolution. And in this particular work, the resolution is crucial because it's about this different level of experience, digesting the image from a distance and then slowly coming to it. And the closer one gets to the surface, more information is revealing itself. And it's very important in these photographs that there won't be a breaking point. There won't be a point where you get into the surface and there is a moment of disappointment, that the surface doesn't hold, that the grain or the fabric of the image start to fall apart. It's very important that the images will constantly have a relationship between a micro and a macro, that there will be different levels of experiences that will hold on and then constantly will open up and enrich the experience of, um, um, of, of the viewer. This is another photograph from the series, and here the destruction is much more pronounced. And what started to interest me about this work as well is, the, is a dialectic or so tension that exists between two moments. There is the moment of creation and the moment of destruction. In all this work, the moments of destruction become the actual moment of creation. So I create the bouquet and then we explode it in an instant, in a flash. And the attempt to hold on to this moment is the moment where the photograph is created. And the way those two moments are opposing each other but also completing each other. And in any act of making there is also a moment of destroying. Um, became fundamental to this work. It's also, there is something in this work that is hidden beyond the surface. On one level, there are, these images are very seductive, but the process of making those images there is, is, is gruesome. We are using explosive devices and we are creating in a studio an in, in actual act of of violence. And the detachment between what a photograph reveals and a physical experience of making it is, um, I, think, I think it's very important and it has a, it kind of reflects upon our experience of looking at any war images or media images and the distance that exists between the image that we perceive and the actual event that um, the camera captured. Another thing that is or kind of a, a, a contradiction that exists in all this work, that often this work is described or associated with still life, because the opening, the reference point, is coming from a still life painting. But these photographs are anything but a still life. These photographs were taken at a speed of eight, eight and a half thousandths of a second. 
they're capturing an event that's happening at an enormous speed. Actually, everything is moving here rather than being static. And once again, there, there is a, a tension or a, a conflict that is inherent in the process of making them. And talking about static images, I would like to go to a painting that was produced by Juan Cotan in 1602. And um, this is one of the first uh, still life painting, Spanish still life painting. Cotan was a very successful painter in Toledo. And for unknown reason, at the beginning or the end of the 16th century, the beginning of the 17th century, he gave up his practice and he became a monk in the monastery. He kept on painting, and from that point onward, all his paintings were created within the remits of his, um, his window. And the all, all, all the paintings were focusing on still life. And they're holding a tension that is very interesting between culture and nature, between the arch geometry of the window and the organic shape of the fruits that he is depicting. There is the parabolic shape of the organic fruit and the arch geometries, and they are contrasting each other and creating a tension between each other. Cotan was um, very interested in uh, Pythagorean equations, and he was working on perfect parabolic um, shapes that are running through the arch geometries in the frame. It's not just that uh, he was working carefully on the, parabo on, on the parabola. Within the parabola, there are con constant transformations that are occurring. So you start with a quince that is almost a perfect circular shape. And as you go down and around, those circular shapes are slowly deformed and being stretched, moved to elliptical shape. And they're not, not just this, they're moving within the plane of the window, and as it goes down, they start to push out, out of the window. So they're constantly, there are mutation and transformation that are almost mathematically are calculated. Also the tensions that exist between the bottom right and the top left, the way they are compressed within the frame, Cotan was trying to achieve equilibrium, which is an interesting moment because it's a moment where everything is in perfect balance, and a moment that is equating death. But he was trying to achieve perfect composition through mathematical com um, calculation. And I was looking at this painting. I mean, I, I, this painting is at the back of my mind for, for many years, and um, I was always attracted to it, and the, the simplicity, the, the Sisyphean, um, um, approach of the painter, the um, uh, exquisite execution and, um, and perfectionism that exists in every detail, and at the same time, it's a kind of those humane qualities that, that, that um, are very apparent in it. And I was looking at this painting in relation to a famous photograph that was taken by, um, by William Edgerton in MIT. William Edgerton is the um, kind of a scientist photographer that um, is the, um, the godfather of high-speed photography. His, his photographs later got some sort of an artistic twist, but the, um, the initial motivation was to provide aids to scientists to, uh, in uh, empirical experimentation. This is a famous photograph where Edgerton managed to capture a bullet at the moment that he's flying through an apple. Edgerton doing something that is relating to Cotan, but also very similar. He's trying to freeze a moment that's happening at an enormous speed, and the moment, that they, the moment he captured the event, once again, everything is in perfect balance. So the apple is still balancing on the bullet. There is the intersection of the vertical, horizontal, the circular shape in relation to the, um, to the thin linear vertical line of the, of the bullet. One of the things that interested me as well when I looked at this, um, this, this work is that on one level I'm constantly talking about what technology allowed today, allowed to look at moment that the naked eye was, was unable to perceive without it, as if we moved from, a from, from an attempt to capture 
realism into a space of hyperrealism. But something is also being reduced and lost through these processes. And I mentioned it earlier, uh, slightly earlier on. When we look at the Cotan painting, when we look at any painting, the experience is very sensual and very physical, because the painting got a real surface. When we look at Cotan or at the Goya painting, every brush stroke left a mark on the canvas. And there is an archaeological process where the marks are building one on top of each other. And when we stand in front of this painting, we can really see Goya, Goya was there, and every touch is, is there for as long as the painting exists. When I start to make my work, in particular this piece of work that's relating to Cotan and Edgerton, it became very important for me that the, the process of producing or perceiving the work won't, will be as removed as possible from the making of a painting. So all these photographs and film were done with digital camera. And there is a big gap between the two, because digital cameras are the, lacking any materiality. The way the photograph or the film are perceived, unlike the canvas, is through pure abstraction. There is a mathematical logarithm that is happening, so the image is being perceived through the lens optically, and then created in a way that there is no way um, for us to, to physically attain. And I'm very much interested in the gaps that exist in means of production. So if we're thinking about painting as a physical and essential experience, and we think about the digital today where there is no materiality at all. In, in traditional photography, we still have the celluloid, and we still have some sort of material encounter between light and silver that existed on the gelatin of the film. But as we move to the digital, this is completely lost. And my interest was to establish sort of relationships that on the one hand, the images are very much resembling painting and the history of painting, but the process of the mean of production is as removed as possible from the way a painting was conceived and created. So I would like to show you um, this film, and it's one of the, f it's the first film that are done in, um, um, in this vein, works that is relating to um, art historical moment, but capturing moments that um, the painters could never conceive or comprehend. In all this work, I took some liberty, and the composition is slightly different, and also the arrangement is different. So if Cotan was using the queens at the top corner here, I substituted it with the pomegranate, and I also moved the pomegranate to a different position because, as you see the film, I'll kind of elaborate a little bit more about it. So um, I'd like to show you this film now and then talk a little bit about it. One of the interesting and surprising things that happened in the process was that as soon as the bullet passed through the pomegranate, it sent the pomegranate in a trajectory that was mimicking the parabolic shape that existed in the original painting by, uh, by Cotan. So the pendular movement of the pomegranate is once again um, conversing with the original composition. The pomegranate is hanging in the middle, but every time it reaches its full height, when it swings to the left, it's occupied the position where the queens was. So it's constantly going through the original composition and then drifting once, away, once again away from it. These films are presented in, in customized screens 
and um, in a frame, in a customized screen, with all the component inside them. And it's very important that they create a sort of a suspension of disbelief. So when the viewer comes to experience them in the gallery, they're not sure if they're looking at a painting or they're looking at, or, or they believe that they are looking at a painting, and then something happens and this belief is being shattered. This tension that exists between our expectation or belief that we're looking at one thing and realizing that we're actually looking at something else is, um, is crucial to me. And um, it brings to the forefront the thought or the relationship that photography has with truth or with, un with our understanding of the world. And I would like to move from this to uh, the new body of work that I'm, I just finished and this tension that exists between reality and appearance between um, our, um, our material or physical experience of the world and, um, um, and some sort of um, um, uh, illusion or deception that, is part, is that, that we often facing um, is very apparent in this work. So to start, this, uh, the, the starting point for this work were three paintings that were um, created by Jan Bruegel. And they are the very early examples of, um, of flower still lives. They were done at the beginning of the 17th century. And it's a very interesting moment. It's a, um, the beginning of the Enlightenment and the, the rational era where um, many things changed and affected the way Bruegel produced his painting. At first sight, they look very naturalistic and realistic, but these paintings are anything but realistic. To start with, this, it's the beginning of um, um, horticulturalism, so uh, the, the, the discipline of um, botanics developed, and all of a sudden, in all these paintings, all natural flowers disappeared. So all the flowers in these paintings could not exist without human intervention. Another thing that is interesting about these paintings is that what we see here is an eternal bloom. These flowers, in, in, in reality, will blossom at different time of the year. So Bruegel was painting them independently and created a moment that, um, um, that does not exist in the natural world, basically taking the role of the creator and achieving, a mom, uh, uh, achieving this um, eternal bloom. But something even further and maybe more interesting is happening. This was the beginning also of imperialism. And exotic flower brought it back into Europe. And Bruegel were using here flowers that could not geographically exist beside each other. So we have here flower from Persia, the tulips are well known that they came from Turkey. So the vase become this kind of sovereign, the, the source of, of um, 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 authority where it flowers from all around the world are being concentrated and contained within it. So we are presented with something that is very persuasive and feel very comfortable as, um, as it's a realistic depiction of flowers, but what we are looking here, it's a, we're looking at a vision, at an illusion that was created by the painter that could never exist in, a, in the world. In this body of work that I developed, it's the first time where I tried to create a, a simulacra. I wanted to achieve perfect resemblance. And what I was working on in the studio is on three-dimensional replicas of those paintings. But I wanted these replicas to be removed even further from where Bruegel took them. So all the flowers that exist here, they're all synthetic. They were all made by hand. Each petal was cut, painted, and was um, and put together. And I wanted to create a double deception here. On the one hand, they, I wanted them to resemble the painting, 
So when somebody looks at them, immediately there is this association because of the, um, the, the close, almost perfect similarity. Um, but I also wanted to create another level of deception where they, the three-dimensional object made syn uh, from synthetic materials, but they become flat, painterly, and the flowers appear as real. So there is um, a certain expectation of the spectator or of the viewer, and then the, re the, the reality that is kind of hidden beyond, behind it. But not just this. I wanted this time to, um, to create another step of removal. And what I did with these flowers is I took them from my studio. So it took us four months to create those three bouquets. We analyzed the composition very carefully, um, and then the golden triangle that Bruegel were using, the build-up from um, the dense area at the bottom, and the way that we build and open up toward, um, toward the top and so forth. And when we finished doing this, all the flowers were taken to, to the studio and um, were placed in front of mirrors. So this is the location where we created these images. So the flowers were put in front of, of a mirror, and the camera was no longer looking at the flowers, but the camera was looking at the reflection of the flowers. And there is something about mirrors that uh, I found very interesting. And actually, it's not just me. From the Renaissance time, painters were using mirrors. From the moment mirrors were invented, the mirrors had a, a major impact on the way painting were produced. But there is, because of the, um, the way they reflect the world, because of the eye fidelity, there is a real confusion that exists between our physical experience and the image that is created by the mirror. And I think an interesting example is the way we, um, there is a distortion or an illusion that's created by the mirror that is so persuasive that we inevitably uh, buy into it. For example, we, we never know ourselves but our image in the mirror, which is always reversed. So. What we conceive as our left is actually our right, and vice versa. So mirrors have this kind of um, um, this, this ability to create an illusion of, of reality. And in, this res in many respects, parallel the process of photography. We often see photographs of other people, of other places, of conflict in another country. And we believe we develop a real moral standing and an understanding as if we were physically there without having any real knowledge about those places. But photographic images have this ability to persuade us and to create a real illusion of um, 